Hello all, and welcome to this session, Blueprints of Innovation, Architecting Corporate Success. I'm Susanna Carlisi of Precision Content, and today I'm pleased to be presenting with one of our clients, Ishida Grover of Cisco Systems. Here's the agenda for this session. First, we'll discuss how Precision Content is helping to modernize Cisco's content. Next, we'll delve into the principles of information architecture, including the perspectives on information architecture and the skill set needed for an information architect. Finally, we'll explore the relevance of information architecture in emerging technologies. But first, we'll start with some introductions. Hi, Ishida. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Cisco? Sure. Hi, Susanna. It's really, it's a pleasure being here. And, um, I'm really excited in terms of, you know, what we are going to present and talk to today. Um, I've been at Cisco for almost for 19 years, and I've been always involved with technical documentation. At this stage of Cisco's content, we decided to um, engage with precision content to do a content audit. And um, that's kind of what started our engagement uh, working with you guys. But overall, I think this is, um, it's been a great ride. And um I look forward to the next chapter of my career at Cisco. And I'm Susanna Carlisi. I'm a senior information architect at Precision Content. I've been in the technical communications industry for almost 30 years, and I've held self several roles, including technical writer, content strategist, and information architect. And Precision Content is a full-service, end-to-end technical communications consultancy based out of Toronto, Canada. We're experts in data, and we provide services in content strategy, writer training, information architecture, and content delivery. So we help companies solve their content problems, optimize their content lifecycle, implement or improve their data solutions, and uh, implement a CCMS. Okay, so let's talk about Cisco's engagement with precision content. Precision Content is currently working with Cisco to modernize the existing content architecture, which has been uh, a book-based architecture uh, in place for over two decades. Ishida, can you talk about the content goals that led you to the engagement with Precision Content? Sure, absolutely. So um, I am directly involved with the, with the technical documentation um, or uh, associate user content that is associated with the Cisco networking uh, product line, which includes the switching, the routing, and uh, the data center product line. These are uh, definitely uh, some of the uh, legacy products. These products have been around for a very long time. So the content ages back to, or was initiated, I should say, two decades or so ago. We'd never really been through a content audit. Ideally speaking, every company, every organization should go through a content audit on a periodic basis. But I think what prompted this was we are looking at re-architecting a lot of our existing content to address some of the newer requirements in terms of what our customers are expecting in, uh, for content structure. The, the new, or I should say, the modern way of reading content, like we all know, no one likes to read. But you know, how do you, how do you make it so that you're actually able to capture your audience's attention very quickly? So all of these things prompted us to realize that we really needed a content audit. How is our content performing against SEO? How is our content performing against general reuse strategies? And how is our content performing performing against self service? So these were the three goals that we were trying to address with the audit, and uh, that's how precision content came into play. It's a lesser known fact is that it's always better to bring in a neutral party to share this kind of feedback because there's no personal agenda, or that's where bringing in uh, bringing in precision content really helped us. Right, right. We can provide that uh, objective perspective. Absolutely, we performed a content audit, and the content audit allows us to get a picture of the current state of the content. And that's really key. Uh, doing so allows you to identify the gaps between the current state and the desired future state. And by knowing where you are, you can map out the direction for where you want to go. So in this project, uh, conducting a content audit allowed us to determine how adaptable the content source is for that dynamic delivery across the required channels. 
And uh, to determine the current state of the content, we performed this uh, content audit focused on the three audit criteria that you mentioned. And this slide summarizes the precision content audit methodology. So in discovery, we hold interviews with the stakeholders to determine the current state of the content, the processes, and the governance policies. Uh, we also learn about the content goals. Next, we performed a content analysis of the content from various product groups. And here we analyze the content against those audit criteria. The next phase, transformation services, included uh, transforming a limited set of content using the precision content writing methodology for writing and structuring micro content. So for those who are not familiar with micro content, uh, micro content is content that is about one primary idea, fact, or concept, is easily scannable, is labeled for clear identification and meaning, and is appropriately written and formatted for use anywhere and anytime it's needed. So it's easy to reuse. To wrap up the audit, we delivered a final report with recommendations for the next step. So Ishida, following the delivery of the final report, your authors uh, completed training on uh, writing and structuring microcontent. Was this a big shift in how they were accustomed to creating content? It's it's interesting you ask that actually, uh, Susanna. We are just about uh, almost done with the fundamentals. Uh, we're done with the fundamentals, and then we did the second part, which is the methods training. And uh, I think the content audit made it very clear that we did have to revamp our writing style, also relook or revisit how our style guide had been written and how. It it had been created. It had evolved over the years, but not enough to be up to snuff with, you know, what, what our audiences are looking for. So going through the training, some of the feedback that I've received on, on a consistent consistent basis from, from the trainees is that there are a lot of things which are uh, which make them think about how to write. Some of them are um, things that they've known about, but have just not been able to implement them. But now realizing how valuable that is or that can be and how it can serve the customer in a positive way, how it can serve the reader in a positive way, it's coming back to realizations that, you know, hey, we need to look at how we've written our content, how the flow has been structured and, and such. It's been a really positive experience for the writing teams. And um, I'm very proud of the team as well to have you know gone through this training and taken it on so seriously. And um, I can definitely see us reaping the benefits of, of this training um, sooner than later. I mean, it could seem overwhelming to try to adapt your content to all of these channels, but... Um... It's doable. And I think with the strategies that we provide in that training, you can see that path forward quite clearly. As mentioned, the content audit was focused on optimized SEO, readiness for self-service, and uh, reuse. What's important to note here is that all of this project is characterized by improving content for delivery. We need to focus on changing the source content to make it more discoverable so that users can find what they are looking for more digestible to enhance usability, and more consistent across the products and releases to enable content reuse where applicable. This slide highlights the main recommended changes to the information architecture of the Cisco content in the key areas of language, content organization, content models, and metadata. Now, let's focus a little bit on the overarching goals. Ashita, can you talk a bit about why developing metrics for content quality is important? And I will say it up front and honestly that I hate numbers, but really there's no going away from numbers. If there is one language anyone and everyone understands, it's, it's, num it's the language of numbers. It was imperative for us to come up with a way to measure and associate a specific score, if you will, to the content we produce. And uh, this was really not just for leadership and management, but I think it was even more important for our writers to see how their content is uh, scores against some of the standards across the industry, like readability or format and, and things like that. And more importantly, how does it serve our customers in terms of case deflection or SEO and, and, and such? So quality basically was a formula which was based off of all of these criteria that the content or, or of all of these goals that 
content has to address. Starting to develop that, starting to work on that, getting the writers to understand what it means and getting the getting my own management team to understand the value of it uh, was extremely important. And I think now that we've worked in that direction a little bit, we are seeing how, you know, some of these interpretations can actually help us in the long run. And and there are many methods um, for measuring that quality. There are manual and automated me- methods for um Evaluating passive voice, readability, um, as you mentioned, accessibility, consistency, scannability, and voice and tone. The other overarching goals are to establish the best practices for the information architecture of Cisco content and also to train a group of Cisco information architects. So that brings us to the question, what is information architecture? Sheeta, how would you describe information architecture? I started to realize that information architecture really is a mindset. It's the way you think. And when I say mindset, I'm talking about curiosity. For a content professional to be curious about who is reading my content, how is the content getting from point A to point B? What actually happens in the authoring? What can I do more about authoring so that the accessibility improves? There are so many dimensions to content which we don't often realize. Anyone who comes with the IA mindset actually will think about these things, is curious about these things, tries to understand some of these nitty-gritty details. And the one context that is the context of, you know, how is my customer going to actually read this content? How is the reader going to consume this content? That's the true North Star. Positive user experience does require an intentional information uh, information architecture strategy. Absolutely, um, yeah. So uh, it is difficult to narrow in on a single definition. Uh, there are so many definitions of information architecture that reflect the diverse roles of information architects. And uh, I think Abby Covert's definition from her book, "How to Make Sense of Any Mess," is broad enough to apply to all IAs. And her definition is um, information architecture is the way we arrange the parts of something to make it understandable. At Precision Content, we define an information architect as someone who organizes, structures, and labels content in an effective and sustainable way, making information findable and understandable. And information architects serve the needs of authors to improve content performance, consistency, and capabilities. And you mentioned, uh, if, you know, from the skill set, what's really important is being curious, uh, being detailed oriented, and also being able to put yourself in uh, the place of the user, you know, is the main focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So this slide describes two perspectives on information architecture, which are both relevant for Cisco content. Uh, The first perspective is that of an information architect for user experience. This type of IA is concerned with uh, the content engagement. Their responsibilities include principles of personalization, SEO, taxonomy, sitemaps. So they're concerned with making the content findable. The second perspective is that of an information architect for content operations. And this type of IA is concerned with content performance. Their responsibilities include content audits, content models, metadata strategy, and plain language guidelines, as well as terminology. What are the uh, different perspectives on content that you envision for a team of Cisco information architects? I think the, uh, the point that I will mention is that, first of all, um, you know, there could, be, there could be a smaller organization that, that is interested in, in bringing in an IA. So really the volume of content and the and the overall footprint that you have in the industry is going to determine how many information architects uh, you actually need. It should be a conscious, deliberate decision to onboard an IA. Uh, Having said that, I am very focused on how every aspect of the content that we create and maintain is looked at in as much detail as possible, trying to cover every dimension of it as um, thoroughly as we can. And saying when I say that, I'm referring to making sure that we are, whatever strategies we design, whatever initiatives we take on, they're based on on positive metrics or need. There has to be a needs assessment in terms of why we are doing certain things. 
what I've realized is that the organization has impeccable processes in place, very thorough, very systematic, whether very well organized. But there is no way to say whether this process is more successful than the other, or what if this process was stopped? What happens then? And that is one thing that I'm I'm trying to get everyone to understand is unless and until we have a measure to the success or failure of a certain process, we don't know whether it's it's good or not. That's point number one. So that's where metrics comes into play. And you'll notice I talk about this uh, structure t- uh, bottom up. It's really about how the initiatives stack up, how they all um, how they all fit into. You know, if, if someone was to think about this as a puzzle, how would they actually fit in? A lot of the decisions we make are based on metrics. Um, a lot of the decisions initiatives that we drive are based on on with the goal of quality content in mind. So I think the training that we are working on with with precision content has a huge role to play is improving the quality of the content. And then we talk about content delivery, and this is where you know how how the content actually shows up on Cisco.com, how it's uh, consumed, how does SEO serve its uh, purpose, how is the layout, all of these things come come into play. So when I talk about an IA, I'm talking about uh, someone or a team of IAs who are actually focused on the content experience from start to finish. Right, right. So some IAs will focus on that navigation on Cisco.com and improving the discoverability of the content. And yeah, yeah. and then other IAs will. And they have a full understanding of how the taxonomies work. They have an understanding of how the Cisco.com structure is set up because there's reason why though that setup exists it, it wasn't someone's it wasn't someone's imagination there, there's a reason why it was set up the way it was and uh, without having that historical knowledge without having that background knowledge and i cannot make uh good decisions right right then then you have your other eyes that will focus on the writing and structuring of micro content absolutely yeah and right. you brought up a good point about knowing the history uh, you've mentioned in the past that any potential IA at Cisco should have a deep knowledge of the product portfolio. Uh, can you explain your reasons for this? When, when we onboard a new uh, new person, a new employee, a new writer, whoever, we must do the diligence of educating them and bringing them up to speed in terms of what the product's about, what the technology is about, and, and such. And the reason being that there's a there's a lot of research, there's a lot of um, innovation that happens with our products on an ongoing basis. So if you're if my average writer cannot do justice to the amount of in, uh, to the innovation or the uh, or the the development in terms of a new technology or a new feature, if they can't do justice to that content. Uh, and how do they do justice? It's not by adding flowery language or, you know, adding too many adjectives. It's about elevating that information higher and in a more visible fashion. So that's where an IA will have a direct role to play because they will, because they have an understanding of the product and the technology, they can educate the writer and say, hey, wait a second, this is, um, this is a technology, this is a feature which is being showcased by a for our product and this is kind of this makes us stand out from our from our competitors so we need to elevate this in our content traditionally what has happened is a lot of content is buried in the monolithic um, config guides and such because of which a lot of the good content unless and until someone does a deliberate search they can't really find it with that background knowledge of how certain technology and features fit in, the I is in a position to educate the writing teams that, ha- you know, this this content needs special treatment. So let's figure out how to elevate this. It takes uh, certain um, skills to be able to unlock that content because there's so much of it and the information that the user needs is is really buried. So we need to find a way to navigate more easily to it. And I think that, and I think there's there's another. If I if I may make another point here, I think from an IA's perspective, not only are they looking at the written content, but they're also looking at complementary content in the product. So oftentimes the the screens, the dialogue boxes, the script on the 
on the you know in the product itself and that's often looked at by by the eyes and and also they they are in a position to correct that or give feedback about it mm-hmm. the funny thing is when you have that expertise in the product and the, and the technology you know there is no limitation you can actually even provide feedback to product development teams that hey if you did feature a you might want to think about feature a.1 because complements uh, the the offerings and ia's role then starts to go way beyond just content they are also looking at how the products technologies the the different websites and the portals that where where our, where our content goes they have a much broader role and a and a, actually a very meaningful role to play right and and they can uh, identify you know between between the different product lines where there are inconsistencies where information that is similar okay. is presented yeah. so differently that it can be confusing to the user because they don't understand why why is it so different is it not the same uh, type of thing yeah. absolutely and mm-hmm. uh, especially in your industry it's super important to consider the relationship between the different products and the components within the larger system and uh, this is another reason why also relevant subject metadata is so crucial to creating context that is where and how the users consume information and this is also where a content audit comes into play where you know you doing a, a periodic content audit will keep us true to ourselves that hey you know the, in this release reuse was done a certain way in the next release we might want to change it or do it a little differently and and you know think about it from those perspectives as well so i think um from an eyes perspective content audits are something which are extremely useful so let's um, discuss information architecture as risk management so as we mentioned without mindful ia common challenges uh, in an organization can negatively impact the overall performance of the content and content challenges arise when creating content and consuming content for creating content, difficulties arise uh, from factors such as large teams, tight release cycles, governance gaps. And for consuming content, uh, users face challenges uh, simply because of the exponential growth in the content over the years. There's simply too much content to sift through. And these challenges result in content that authors find difficult to create, maintain, and scale, and users find difficult to scan, navigate, and understand. So the impact on the organization includes rising technical support calls and associated costs. Inefficient processes also result in longer content development timelines, duplication of work, and ineffective tool use. To mitigate risk, IA and governance are critical. So the IA can serve as the keepers of the content lifecycle processes uh, that are developed collaboratively with the teams. Uh, Ishida, can you provide your view on governance policies at Cisco? From a governance perspective, what has happened is our tools are designed in such a way that uh, we definitely are uh, we we are definitely held true to records management. So anything that's published to Cisco.com, there is a record of that. So. It's happened in my career two times at least where um, technical documentation came to our rescue um, in a legal situation where one of our competitors were challenging a patent or was challenging some some feature development or some uh, feature offering, I should say. And based on technical documentation, they were able to able to convey that Cisco was in the right. So that that's where I think good governance uh, processes definitely have a huge role to play. Now, having said that, that, we have to be extremely careful from a compliance perspective. We have to be very mindful of the fact that none of our content is uh, published without proper reviews. Even our review tools actually have been robust enough where we have kept track of pretty much every single feed piece of feedback that was given to the writers. So good good governance processes being put in place by IAs are extremely crucial. 
Absolutely. And that is end to end across the entire continent life cycle, including the reviews and um, also um, making sure that all of those records are maintained. So our last topic, uh, IA before AI. So IA before AI is something we are hearing more and more because the quality of data does impact AI. Uh, while LLMs can be trained on medium to large unstructured documents, there is evidence that focused, structured, semantically labeled on-topic content provides better results and less hallucination. And I've included two links to research in this direction. Uh, IAs have the skills to create the required focused microcontent, that is content with a clear purpose, clear target audience, and clear intended user response. So IA skills are now being sought not only in content teams, but throughout the organization, since many enterprises are focusing on creating enterprise-specific LLMs. Um, Ishida, what is your perspective on this? I think, um, you know, it's, uh, I've always been biased in favor of content, and I always felt that content professionals really should be consulted and given us, they, we should be given that kind of stature in the industry. But I think with AI coming into our um, ecosystem, with the aggressiveness that it has come with, I think it is, it, it is absolutely obvious that information architects have a huge role to play in this scenario. Um, <clears throat> it's a known fact that structured content has a huge value when it has huge value when it comes to AI and how some of these um, LLMs uh, adopt or use existing structured content. But the interesting part is going to be validity of the content. Content, content everywhere, not a drop to consume, right? So it's kind of like, <clears throat> what do you do when you have, there's no dearth of content, there's no dearth of people who are wanting to create content, but it's really about how how good the content is and how valid it is, how uh, credible it is, how credible is the source, I should say. So <clears throat> this goes back to the point I was making earlier, is that, Gov governance comes into play, and unless and until you have a have proper a proper governance infrastructure, you're not going to be able to verify the validity of the content and how how credible it is. So, when we have good governance, we have good structure for our content. <clears throat> we have good governance for our content. We produce valid content, and these are all the <clears throat> activities that in I can actually help influence in an organization. Absolutely. And uh, you bring up uh, a good point, content, content everywhere. So um, I think that the content teams will be more prominent throughout the organization. Uh, also with, um, you know, creating those taxonomies, contributing to the uh, controlled vocabularies, um, and the terminology, it's, uh, you know, it, those are skills that writers should also try to develop. Most definitely. And that takes us to the end of our presentation. So thank you, Ishida, for your valuable insights. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and I also want to thank the audience for attending this session.